Blessed Virgin Mary appeared at La Salette, France in 1846. Although this particular apparition is not as well known as her appearances at either Fatima in 1917 or at Lourdes, it nevertheless carried a very startling prophecy, namely that Rome would lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. If we consider the following pictures, is it fair to say that this is happening today before our very eyes? I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today to discuss La Salette are three priests who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate, a congregation of traditional Catholic sisters in Round Top, New York. Father Donald Sanborn, pastor of St. Pius X Church in Warren, Michigan. And Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Therese of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio. Reverend Fathers, thank you for being on One Catholic's Belief. Father Jenkins, what could you tell us about La Salette? Well, La Salette was uh, the first of uh, a series of very famous apparitions. There were also other apparitions which did not gain such notoriety, but this was the first of very famous apparitions, uh, akin to uh, Our Lady's apparition at Lourdes, and her apparition is at Fatima. But La Salette preceded the, the others. Uh, La Salette uh, took place on September 19th, 1846, the very year that uh, Pope Pius IX became the Pope. And it was interesting because Pope Pius IX was elected with the reputation of being very liberal and with the anticipation that he would liberalize the church. And so uh, Our Lady appeared to a young girl named Melanie and uh, to a young associate of hers named Maximin in the hills of France and uh, Melanie was out uh, tending her father's livestock at the time and while the two children were playing together uh, building a little shrine a little church and whatever else they had the habit of doing together because they were rather devout children uh, Melanie saw a woman uh, seated and weeping and uh, Melanie approached and uh, the woman began to to speak to her and uh, told her some very fascinating things very startling things about uh, God's judgment on the world and uh, the, the the evil of a man's sin and how a man had failed to appreciate God's love and how uh, our Lord was, was ready to strike the world in wrath because his love had been rejected. Uh, and so um, uh, the apparition gave to Melody a number of uh, very interesting prophecies. And uh, I don't know how long it lasted, but uh, ultimately then the, the vision disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of this apparition was made known by Melody and Maxima when they returned home. Um, the, the, this event raised quite a, a stir mm -hmm. in the, the France, and especially that area of France, uh, especially because of the nature of the prophecies. They were very striking. Very right. strikingly, very startling prophecies. And um, so that eventually the children were actually brought to St. John Vianney, who was known uh, not only for his holiness, but also for his his uh, gift of prophecy mm -hmm. and his uh, ability to discern spirits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at first, he uh, kind of browbeat the children, uh, thinking that uh, you know, he could treat them roughly, and if they um, held to their story, that it, there might be some truth to it. But, but evidently, he browbeat them excessively, and they eventually denied, or at least he interpreted what they said as being a denial 
uh, of what they had to say mm -hmm. about the apparition. But then later he repented of it. And he, uh, he announced that he had become convinced that the apparition was true. Hmm. And the child's d denial was a result of, of his pressure brought to bear on them. Hmm. Um, the account of the apparition that we have is a later account written by the girl Melanie. The original account uh, was never published. And uh, the later account uh, labors under suspicion in some circles because it was not given formal approval by the by the Pope at the time and uh, the uh, members of the of the hierarchy came down very hard on the account of the apparitions and the prophecies that we have today but when you read the text of the prophecies you can understand why there was such an aversion uh, to them and uh, why members of the hierarchy were so reluctant to give them credence. Mm -hmm. Father Kelly, uh, what is your impression of this very, very striking statement that uh, Rome would lose the faith and become the seat of Antichrist? <clears throat> well, before we get into that, uh, Melanie originally wrote down an account of the apparition and also of the message that was given to her by the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that was sent to Pope Pius IX in Rome. And remember, Pius IX had this reputation for being liberal. He read it. He did not publish it, did not reveal it, but did not uh, say that it was not uh, authentic. Perhaps that message had a profound effect on him and on what turned out to be a glorious uh, reign in the history of the Catholic Church. But the specific thing that most people focus on is the very astounding and extraordinary statement that Rome would lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. That is truly astounding. We do know this. We know that the Roman Church per se can never lose the faith. The Roman Church, which is the, uh, the diocese or the church uh, in, in that sense, established by the Apostle Peter will last until the end of time and will maintain the faith until the end of time. And so we have to make the distinction between, let us say, certain members of the hierarchy losing the faith and the city of Rome itself losing the faith. There are other indications in the writings of the Fathers that indeed the overwhelming majority of members of the church in Rome will lose the faith because it is, I believe, the unanimous teaching of the Fathers that the city of Rome must be destroyed before the end of the world uh, because of its persecution of the Church. And the thing which held back the wrath of God was the fact that the faithful lived in the city. And so when the faithful fall away, then the wrath of God will be unleashed against the city. Maybe that is what we see uh, being prepared by God in our own day. Jenkins. Now, St. John Bosco, who was a contemporary of these apparitions at La Salette, also prophesied with regard to Rome and what would happen to the faith in Rome. He prophesied it to uh, one of his own uh, one-time students who had gone on to become a bishop that uh, one day missionaries would have to preach the gospel in Rome, in and around Rome, and it would be as, dif as difficult to preach the gospel around the city of Rome as it is for missionaries, as, as it was at that time for his missionaries to preach the gospel in the Tierra del Fuego um, area of South America where the cannibals were eating the missionaries. He said that's how difficult it would be to preach the gospel around Rome. When this would happen, he said he, di he did not indicate when that would take place. But uh, it is important also to, to interpret the church's judgment of La Salette from the way she dealt with uh, the, the, the idea of Our Lady of La Salette. There, were, uh, there was a congregation of priests established under the title of Our Lady of La Salette. And there stands now on the site of the apparitions a magnificent church, a beautiful church, uh, dedicated to Our Lady of La Salette. So it's clear that the church does sanction uh, the apparition uh, of Our Lady of La Salette. For the Sanborn, very typically, uh, when we see pictorial representations of La Salette, we see Our Lady weeping, 
And I believe that in the course of her revelations to Melanie, the reason she was weeping is because people abuse the holy day, they do not keep Sunday holy, and because they abuse the name of God. Uh, what does this rather striking image of Our Lady tell us, especially today when Sunday is just like in any other day and the Lord's name creeps in a conversation just as casually as the article the? Well, looking at 19th century France, you're, you're looking at a period of time in which, due to the revolution that had happened a number of decades before, the entire Catholic culture had been overthrown and was gradually being overthrown in the, in the hearts and the minds of the people, so that what was commonplace, say, 50 years before, to observe Sundays uh, very, very faithfully and for people to be pious in their conversations was now going by the wayside. And more and more people were becoming free thinkers and atheists and agnostics and uh, materialism and commerce was becoming more important than the faith and piety. And uh, what to us seems to be something uh, not terribly important in, in, in the face, say, of the gross impurities of our time, and uh, it was extremely important, and it is still very important, uh, because this was the beginnings of it. It was the beginnings of the atheism of the world which was once Catholic. This is the time when it all happened, and our Blessed Lady was weeping over these signs of the public atheism of, of France and of Catholic Europe in general. I wonder if uh, some of the people watching this program would be interested in hearing uh, the words attributed to Our Lady in this apparition. So they do have a, a small account of it here. Absolutely. And uh, marked off some passages that I thought would be instructive to them to give them an idea of what Our Lady had to say at La Salette. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, at one point, Our Lady said to Melanie that uh, she could reveal something in the year 1858, which is interesting because that was the year that uh, Our Blessed Mother appeared to Bernadette at Lourdes. And this is what she said that Melanie should make known in 1858. The priests, ministers of my son, the priests by their wicked lives, by their irreverence and their impiety in the celebration of the holy mysteries, by their love of money, the love of honors and pleasures, the priests have become cesspools of impurity. <laughs> yes, the priests are asking vengeance, and vengeance is hanging over their heads. Woe to the priests and to those dedicated to God, who by their unfaithfulness and their wicked lives are crucifying my son again. The sins of those dedicated to God cry out towards heaven and call for vengeance. And now vengeance is at the door, for there is no one left to beg mercy and forgiveness for the people. There are no more generous souls. There is no one left worthy of offering a stainless sacrifice to the eternal God for the sake of the world. And then uh, Melanie reported Our Lady's words, In the year 1864, Lucifer, together with a large number of demons, will be unloosed from hell. They will put an end to faith little by little, even in those dedicated to God. They will blind them in such a way that unless they are blessed with a special grace, these people will take on the spirit of these angels of hell. Several religious institutions will lose all faith and will uh, suffer the loss of many souls. It's easy to see why the church would take these uh, uh, prophecies uh, as, uh, with such a, a striking... Uh, of terror and why they would be so reluctant to uh, so those things were not true at the time the clergy uh, in in Europe was not as corrupt as uh, I mean they were not corrupt uh, they actually were were obeying the rules uh, quite well it was a good time for the clergy uh, and that would not describe the, the the situation at the time that definitely refers to sometime in the future Unfortunately, it describes our own time, mm -hmm. uh, and it describes our own time perfectly. Uh, and uh, it, it really is foreboding uh, with regard to, to what is going to happen to us. You're watching what Catholics believe were to cut one of you off in midstream. Father Kelly? Father <laughs> no, I guess I was... Uh, <coughs> I'm perfectly willing to continue. All right. <laughs> um, 
Um, it's interesting in reading the prophecies of La Salette how much they pertain to the clergy, the hierarchy of the church. For example, uh, Our Lady went on to say, churches will be locked up or desecrated, priests and religious orders will be hunted down and made to die a cruel death, several will abandon the faith, and a great number of priests and members of religious orders will break away from the true religion. And among these people there will be bishops. And she goes on to say, everywhere there will be extraordinary wonders as true faith has faded and a false light enlightens the people. Woe to the princes of the church. Those are the cardinals. Woe to the princes of the church who think only of piling riches upon riches to protect their authority and to dominate by their pride. He says, Our Lady then gives a prophecy, which is a prophecy of hope. She talks about the, uh, the coming of the Antichrist and talks about all the calamities that are going to strike the world. But then she talks about God's special protection upon those who remain true to faith. Uh, do you want me to continue? Absolutely. Okay. She says, a forerunner of the Antichrist with his troops gathered from several nations will fight against the true Christ, the only savior of the world. He will shed much blood and will want to annihilate the worship of God to make himself be looked upon as God. The earth will be struck by calamities of all kinds. In addition to plague and famine, which will be widespread, there will be a series of wars until the last war which will then be fought by the ten kings of the Antichrist, all of whom will have one and the same plan and will be the only rulers of the world. Before this comes to pass, there will be a kind of false peace in the world. People will think of nothing but amusement. The wicked will give themselves over to all kinds of sin. But the children of the Holy Church, the children of my faith, my true followers, they will grow in their love for God and in all the virtues most precious to me. Blessed are the souls humbly guided by the Holy Ghost. I shall fight at their side until they reach a fullness of years. And uh, she goes on to speak of the coming of the Antichrist, and this is where she gives the prophecy. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The demons of the air, together with the Antichrist, will perform great wonders on earth and in the atmosphere and men will become more and more perverted. Now, of course, here she's referring to the words of St. Paul, or echoing the words of St. Paul in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, which talks about the coming of the Antichrist. And uh, one might wonder there, when St. Paul says that the Antichrist will work such tremendous signs that he would be able to deceive even the chosen souls of God, the elect, uh, were that permitted, and how the days of the Antichrist will be shortened in order to preserve the chosen souls of God from being deceived by him. And one might wonder, well, well, well how is this possible that the Antichrist should, should work such signs and wonders? Well, the Antichrist is going to be the, the quintessential liar. He is going to be the charlatan of charlatans, the liar of liars. And he will be so convincing that he will be able to lie more convincingly than anybody else will be able to tell the truth. And the people will need a special grace to preserve them from falling victim to his lies. And the question is, why will God give that grace to some and not to others? And St. Paul gives the answer in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, which everyone should read. And his answer is that there were those who will be deceived. God will give them a spirit to make them susceptible to lies because they did not love the truth. And that is what is going to distinguish those who receive the grace to see through the lies of the Antichrist, that they will love the truth. One of perhaps the most uh, distressing uh, things about the situation of the past 15 or 20 years has been the following, that the Catholic instinct is opposed to the spirit of reforms. And the means by which people were coerced or browbeat into accepting the reforms was a spirit of you must obey. These changes were the first time something like this was imposed from the top down. We saw a number of pictures at the beginning of the program. We saw this meeting of Assisi. We saw John Paul II being marked by the adorers of Shiva. We saw a picture of the uh, Buddha being put on the table of San Pietro and Assisi by the Dalai Lama, who's held to be semi-divine by his followers. 
how, you know, people when they see this, they either don't want to believe it happens if they don't actually see a picture, and then if they see a picture, I could understand, they become very distraught. What would you tell these people when they see this? Well, it is unbelievable. It is uh, incomprehensible. It is inconceivable that such things should happen unless we are perhaps in that time spoken of by the Apostle Paul. In that same uh, second epistle to the Thessalonians, St. Paul does say to the people then that the Antichrist will not come until the great apostasy takes place. And when the great apostasy, apostasy takes place, then the Antichrist will come. And then he says what uh, Saint, uh, what Father Jenkins said. Uh, he says that uh, those who do not love the truth will be given a confusing spirit. And then finally, St. Paul gives to us the instrument by which we will be protected from the deceptions. And the instrument that St. Paul gives is tradition. He says, after describing the apostasy, the coming of the Antichrist, the spirit of confusion that will be given to those who do not love the truth, he ends it by saying, therefore hold fast to the traditions which you have received, whether by word or in writing. Father Sanborn, what would you tell those who say, well, you know, you're being disobedient by following the traditions? That it is impossible to be disobedient by following tradition. Uh, the, uh, I would say, look at the whole picture of Vatican II and the reforms. You are not seeing there a, a development of the Catholic faith or a few minor changes that popes have always made in the course of history, uh, the history of the church and, and with regard to disciplines, you are seeing a complete cleavage from the Catholic religion. You are seeing a break and the abandonment of doctrines which have always been held sacred by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church says that it is the one true faith because it is the one true church of the one true God who is our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, by its very essence, cannot admit the truth of other religions. If it does, it is a betrayal of its very essence, of, of its very nature as the church of Christ. It has a, the obligation of being faithful to the true God who is Christ. Therefore, for for John Paul II to be signed by the, the Shiva worshiper or for him to offer uh, cucumber skins to the snake god as he did someplace else or to drink potions in Polynesia, uh, to do just anything that anyone at any religion considers sacred or spiritual is a sign that he does not believe that the Catholic Church is the one true religion of the one true God. That is a, a destruction of the very foundation of faith. And that is going to bring, because he is in that position, or at least apparently in that position, because I do not feel that he is a true pope of the Catholic Church, but because he has an appearance of being in that position, that is going to bring about, in my opinion, and has brought about, the general apostasy from the faith. People say, look at him. He doesn't believe that the Catholic Church is the one true faith. Look at him with the Shiva worshiper. Look at him with this, look at him with that. We're all one. It's all one big God, one big religion, and it doesn't matter what you believe. What would you say, Reverend Fathers? We often get many calls to this program of people who are very encouraged by seeing this. For instance, there was a gentleman who wrote to us from New Jersey who said, uh, your show, What Catholics Believe, is my favorite program. It's the only TV show I watch regularly. It's consistently fine current television program. It's wonderful because it presents true Catholic doctrine to an audience otherwise numbed and disgusted by TV's trashy distractions. It says, devout Catholics thirst for this show. On this show, at least, priests say what priests should say. On this show, priests denounce sin, extol virtues, and try to guide souls uh, to a life in grace. Many people are desperately trying to hold fast what would your advice be to them? How should, what should they do in these times of confusion? They should 
not even consider the possibility that the Catholic faith can be reformed. They must know and must understand that in order to be a Roman Catholic, in order to be a member of the true church established by Jesus Christ that goes back to our Lord himself, they must have true worship, they must have true morality, and they must have the truth that was revealed by Christ and taught down through the ages by the popes. If they do not have those things where they go to church, they are not in the Catholic Church. And therefore, they should get out of those places and look for a place that has the true mass said by a true Catholic priest, but who also adheres to the, the true faith. It, it is as though uh, an atomic bomb has been dropped on the church and there is confusion, there is utter disarray, there is widespread heresy and abandonment of the truths revealed by our Lord and of moral standards. We're living in a time like a, a post-atomic war time. And what they have to do is they have to get a hold of the things necessary for their survival. And therefore, they must reach out to the traditions of the church, grab hold of them, hold on until our Lord restores normalcy to the church. If you'd like to find out about mass locations, please call us 1-800-44663. We need your support to continue. Please call and pledge. If you pledge 50 or more,